Hello YouTubers, this is a new session where we get to explore uh, playing around with multiple programming languages from all over the place to kind of apply uh, concepts of the engineering standard or you know for short we call it the standard it's a simplified way of designing any system whether it's a simple system or an enterprise level system in in, in a very uh, maintainable uh, readable you know non-complex matter and today I'm going to play around with Kotlin you know we played around with go programming languages on Scala if you haven't seen those you know go back you know to this series and see the different languages that we played around with Today we're going to play around with Kotlin. Kotlin is, you know, an up and running and up and coming kind of programming language that, you know, uh, gained a lot of popularity amongst, you know, Android developers. So if you're using a Samsung or a, you know, any Android phone really, it doesn't have to be Samsung, it could be any phone, you know, that runs Android, you know, it's probably one way or another either, either written in some Java or some Kotlin. And today we're going to play around with that. So let's take a look. First of all, you know, I thought it would be probably nice if I kind of give people, a, a, you know, a quick, you know, kind of a quick and dirty uh, introduction to the language, right? What is what is Scotland, what the language is, you know, what it looks like and all that. So here's Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin is is designed, you know, by JetBrains. So that's that's interesting. The JetBrains is the very same uh, company that you know we're using to kind of run like the IDE basically that we're using. You know, if you're using IntelliJ or you know uh, Writer or any of that, that's the company that kind of does you know these. I didn't know that they are the ones that that designed this language. And you know, it's Apache licensed. You know, it was uh, kind of introduced. It first appeared in 2011. Right, so it's almost you know 11 years old, right, and 12 years old, right. It has some concepts and ideas and all that, and people love to use the language to kind of play around. When I, while I'm I'm playing with the language, and you'll see that in a second, it has some really amazing you know concepts. It, it looks a lot like Scala, like you could feel you know there is a lot of Scala in it, kind of functional programming language in it. There is a little bit of hint of Java in it, you know, but it also has its own personality. It's its own kind of thing that it does. Let's try a new project, shall we? So let's go up in here. Here's a new project. What is that? Let's cancel this. I need to start a new project. Let's call it, you know, a standard Kotlin. Okay, and or Kotlin standard. Okay, so it's a Kotlin standard. Right, and then I actually forgot. <laughs> I forgot my naming convention. <laughs> let's go. I like to stay consistent and, and all that. So let's see. When I did Scala, did I start? Oh, standard Scala. Okay, so standard Kotlin. Okay, perfect. So standard. I was right the first time. Standard Kotlin. And let's let's put this in its own folder. Like this. And it's a simple application. Great. And then I'm gonna go and say next. I think I need to expand this guy a little bit just to kind of, yeah, there you go. So on the left side here, you have Kotlin, and I'm choosing standard Kotlin. We already did Scala. We're going to do a little bit of Rust later and Java and all that. Let's, say, let's go to the next thing. You know, here we go. And then I'm going to kind of finish and create the project. So here's a new window. Here we go. And then let's do this. So if you look in the source, the source kind of structure you have main Kotlin and resources test Kotlin and resources very straightforward no problem there it's it's very similar like I said uh, very similar to Scala so you're gonna see a lot of you know similarities here and there let's just get started in under Kotlin I'm gonna create a simple brokers and then storages right and under the storages I'm gonna create a Kotlin interface so let's do that Kotlin class file interface I storage broker Okay, I'm going to stick to some of the naming conventions that we use in, in .NET just to kind of, you know, bring, you know, a little bit of simplicity and kind of understanding to this. But I know there's there's certain naming conventions for each and every one of these. Uh, you can name it whatever you want as long as you can name the concrete and the interface somewhat similar, right? I think that's that would be cool. So I'm going to go and say insert student. We need a student model. So there's student, student, like this. So that's the interface. Let's go and create real quick a new package here that I'm going to call models students. There you go. So under students, I'm going to create a a Kotlin class. Let's call it student. Great. And the student just like so just like we did with uh with 
uh, Scala, right? You can basically go onto your model and basically start defining, you know, the property. So I can go here and say, well, I want an ID, which is going to be an int, and I want a name, which is going to be a string. You don't need these anymore. It looks a lot like Scala. Super, super similar. Let's go back to the storage here. Alt enter. There's your import. So far, so good. And here is your interface. And here's all that kind of good stuff. Okay. This interface, however, is not being used by anybody or anything. So let's go ahead and try to implement a, a storage broker. So here is a Kotlin class. I'm going to go and say storage broker. Right, and this storage broker here, it doesn't take any any inputs, but it inherits from I storage broker like this. Okay, and now this guy is saying, hey, you don't, you have things that are not implemented. Boom, here's my implement. Here's one. Okay, there's a bunch of really cool things in Kotlin. One of them is this guy, right? So, whoever thought about this is a genius. They basically went and said. There's a big difference between going and saying, hey, I want to throw a not implemented exception like this versus going and saying, hey, no, this is not an exception. I'm just not ready to implement this yet. So this is this is philosophical, right? This is do you do you actually throw an exception when something is not implemented? Is that actually an exception? Or is this something else that's still a, a, a circuit breaker but doesn't qualify as an exception? Right, it doesn't qualify as an exception. So we'll notice that uh, Kotlin is having this amazing concept called to do. They know that a lot of engineers will go and do this in their code to do. I don't do this personally, but a lot of engineers will go and say, you know, implement student or something like that. They said, okay, so since you're gonna do this anyway, why don't I give you this as part of your code? So you take care of it the exact same way you take care of your code. This to do piece in here is the equivalent, exactly the equivalent of throwing not implemented exception, right? The only difference is it's a much nicer, better implementation of, you know, your way to express. That's what programming languages are all about. Expression. You want to be able to express that you're not ready to implement a certain feature yet. In our case here, no, we, we actually can implement this. So I'm, I'm going to take away this one. I'm going to say return student. This is okay, right? And we want to say that this guy actually returns to I forgot that one. So we need to go here and say this guy returns student. Here we go. And then uh, I need to do this in here. So student. So you see a little bit of similarity here and there. Scala says you don't need that return type, but you need to put an equal sign in here. It's a trade-off. You're going back and forth between different languages. But, you know, these, you know, I mean, Kotlin is also just another really smart cousin of Java because it's running on the JVM. Right, so it's just another smart cousin. <clears throat> okay, so we have this done. Let's go to the next thing. I have my brokers. Now I need to go build my services. So here's back package, services, and then students. So this is a student service. I'm going to go here and create a interface. So here is my Kotlin interface. And I'm going to go and say I student service, like this. This is your student service. And your student service will be implementing a function called add student right so this is add student takes in a student as an object input parameter returns a student and that's it great i love the flexibility of packages i can add multiple things to the same package with no problem i can pull multiple things you know under the same package it's all great okay we need to implement <clears throat> we need to implement this guy so we need to go here and say here is my Kotlin class, and I'm going to go here and say student service, like this. And this student service needs to inject a storage broker. So here's my storage broker. I need to do that val thing in here, right? But it also implements I student service. So that's the implementation. So you have the injection in here. You have the student service in here. It might get a little bit more interesting when you try to implement things like um, you have multiple dependencies. Like let's say we have the two, three rule, right? So you have a bunch of these in here. How does that look like? Do you push that guy to the bottom like this? And then you go and say, you know, I have, I don't know, I have this and then Val, another dependency in here and so on and so forth. You know, the aesthetics of this is going to be 
quite interesting. This here I'm going to leave intentionally as is, not yet implemented. Again, one of my favorite things so far about Kotlin is to be able to express yourself in this particular manner, right? Kotlin, unlike other programming languages, it doesn't really care if you have your open parens, squiggly brackets in here or here, doesn't matter. That's not erroneous. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, so we have the bare minimum, just basic things that we need to do to have a, we, we are doing test-driven development, so we need to write a test first to make sure that we actually have a proper implementation in here. Let's jump over to the test side. There's some nice things in the test here that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, let's create a Kotlin class and let's call it, uh, actually let's create a folder first. So under the folder I want to create services and then students like this and then under students I want to go and create a Kotlin uh, test class which is called student service tests. Okay, great. Here comes the fireworks, right? Kotlin has this nice library, and you know, it's all about the ecosystem and what you can do in that ecosystem and all that. It has this library, cool, cool library called Mock, Mock with the K, like two Ks like that, right? And this library is going to help us a lot, do a lot of cool things, you know, in how we kind of verify and mock, you know, certain, you know, behaviors and how we verify certain things has been called a couple of times and all that kind of stuff. First of all, we need to go to this build grader gray gradle right and add a bunch of dependencies here i need the mock thing in here i'm going to copy that because i'm not going to remember that off the top of my head this io mock and then you go refresh this guy so it's going to go pull all the things that you need and now we need to basically start writing a test so i'm going to go down here here's my tests and all you got to do is just say at test like this at test here's the kotlin one and then I'm going to go and say function should watch this. This coming one is going to blow your mind. So you can go and say should add student the, the same way we do in, in C sharp. So add student like this. You could do that. Or you could do this. Watch this. Should add student. And that's also valid. How crazy is that? Like you can express your test name with spaces the way you want it to be displayed without having to worry about putting underscores or hacking around you know to make it look readable or any of that stuff right so that's even a step further from um, from what we were doing with Scala when we were saying test and then you just pass in the test name and it will know what to do these guys are taking it a little bit further they're going crazy right they went they basically went and said no you don't have to do that you know, no, just express, you know, should add student like this. Just express it the way, the natural way, and we will understand based, based on that little tick that this is a, uh, you really mean a function that is supposed to be, t and, it, and it will render like that. Like if you run the test, if we run the test right here, it will actually show up down here exactly like that. I think it might error out because we don't have a, um, Maybe we don't have a verify or anything. Yeah, there's nothing going on. See, should add student. How clean is that? That's so clean. I love that. I love that. It's so easy on the eye. I love it. Okay, we'll keep that around because I like it. So given when then, like this, and then I'm going to go and say I have a random student, right? So here is, watch this. So if I go and say student like this, I can go and say mock, and it just knows. Right, so remember in Scala we had to go and do this and then pass in the student in here, right? That's what we used to do. In here be like, nope, you don't even have to do that. Just define the type and say mock. It, it's, it, it feels a lot like doing this in C Sharp. So random student, right? Uh, oh, in C Sharp you could do something like this. Student, like this, and then you go and say equals new, like that. It feels a lot like it. However, the problem with that is that we don't have that kind of power in the mock itself. Like the mocking in .NET could actually use some enhancement and improvement. Like as I'm working with different languages, I'm starting to see opportunities. Okay. So here's my input student, just like we do with everything else. So that's student equals random student. And then val um, inserted student. 
So for the people that haven't watched this, we change, we create a bunch of variables with different names so they fit in the context that you're building for your service, right? Um, and then the last thing is expected student, right? So that's my expected student. Here's student equals inserted student. Just by looking at this, you can see like according to the standard, the engineering standard, you basically are reading the story. You're going to pass an input. It's going to look like le a lot like the inserted. The inserted is what we expect to be the equivalent of expected. Okay, so far so good. Let's go build a broker, a mock of a broker rather. So let's say and go and say storage broker mock. And that is I storage broker. And that's just a mock, just like that. Great. Let's build a service. There so is a student service. Right, so this is I student service, but this one is going to be initialized because that's the subject of this, right? And of course, you're supposed to put these in a um, oh, yeah, there's no new, you could just pass in a storage broker mock like this, and that should do the trick. And I think probably I forgot in the student service, did I? Aha, uh -huh. I did the exact same mistake last time while I was kind of training myself to do this. Oh, before I do that, can I just do underscore in here just for my own learning? Ah, uh, how do you do that? Ah, uh, so in Scala you do this, in Kotlin you do a star, just like Java. So it basically kind of leaned more towards the other cousin, or the mother, really. Java is like the mother of them all. Java is even the mother of C Sharp, you know, it's, it heavily influences C Sharp in certain ways. Okay, so this is me kind of saying, give me everything in your storage, give me everything you have. Uh, in the storage package. Okay, so let's go back to this guy. This guy should be happy now. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I love that. So this is mock, and this is like this. Great. Okay, now let's test things. First of all, we need to actually do the mocking. Now watch this fun part. If I want to mock a, a storage broker mock to kind of return something, right, we can go here and say uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever, right, I think it's whenever, if I'm not mistaken, let me go back and, and look at my previous projects just to make sure that I'm doing the right things. I think it's whenever, oh, every, I'm sorry. Whenever is something else. Every, right, and then you go and say storage broker mock dot insert student with this input student. Watch this. If you want to stay on the same line, all you got to do is just say returns and then inserted student, just like that. One line, no problem. So everything looks like very every time you call inserted student, it will return inserted student. Sometimes that doesn't work out. You want to go to the next line. So what do we do? We take a new line, put a dot in here, and then encapsulate this as a parameter. I love this dynamism. It's not super consistent, but it's dynamic, and I love it. I'm in love with it. It's beautiful. I think IntelliJ could do a little bit more with the coloring of these statements just to make it a little bit less kind of uh, damp, I guess. But this is this is just, you know, kind of, again, aesthetics, just, you know, beautiful things. Okay, so actual student. And here is my student that I'm supposed to get back from the service. And there is here's my student service dot add student. And I'm going to pass in the input student. So the expectation is, right, we want to assert true that actual student is equivalent to expected student. See how the language of the variables is changing from one to another. I think it's a comma. Is it like this? Okay, what am I missing? Tell me. Alt enter, replace. Oh, assert equals. There you go. Nice. Nice. And then we want to verify. So the same thing. You can go here and say verify. And in front of this verify, you can say times, I guess. Times equal one time. Right? Or or what did I do with it? Let's see. I think it's times like that. It's uh oh, it's exactly, not times, exactly. So exactly, exactly one time. <clears throat> and then you're basically saying uh uh here's my storage broker mock dot insert student with the input student. So you're basically going here and saying 
verify <clears throat> that this actually happened. <clears throat> I want you to verify that this dependency has been called exactly only once. Just like that. And just like that, we have ourselves, ourselves a failing test. Again, ideally, this setup here should go into somewhere here where you go and say before or something like that. But, you know, I'm trying to kind of make this as potentially as simple as possible. Potentially as simple as possible. So this is the before test, I think. And, you know, do you just... You just set up a function or something like that. Anyway, it, this is your equivalent of a constructor, basically, that's doing that work for you. Okay, let's run this guy. Let's see here. Uh, let's go like this. There's a big part of this that I'm actually just doing my own really quick research and then giving you my first impressions as I'm learning about this. So here's this guy is failing. It's basically, see, uh, an operation is not yet implemented. It doesn't say it's an exception. <laughs> it doesn't say it's a it's some it's it's not conceptually an exception. It's basically going and saying this is a a thing that's not yet it's an error. It's an error that happened, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's go implement that. Let's go here into the service itself. And I'm gonna go here and say return this dot storage broker dot insert student. There you go. So does that make my test pass? Let's find out. Let's do this. Here we go. Run, run. There you go. Done. Right? Test driven, super clean. You know, you can see how, you know, um, you know, certain concepts can be applied to this language. It's all said and done, right? Uh, ideally with, you know, you can see like as as I'm growing and learning about these, this is all a project called the standard universal, meaning that you can apply a, a, a standard concepts to any programming language or anything in life in general. Like even if you're building hardware, you have dependencies and purposes and exposure. The same thing is happening in here. Uh, this structured mindset can overcome the problem that a lot of engineers have when they're trying to learn a new programming language. Because now you can overcome that so easily. You can basically go and say, no, I don't need that. You know, I already know what I need to implement in this language. It'll take you like literally maybe 30 minutes to figure out exactly what you need to do because you're looking for particular things in this language. Of course, every language has its power, but this is this is really where it comes down to. Okay, let's share this project on GitHub. So here it is, so I can drop it in the video so you can take a look at it. Uh, repository name, standard Kotlin, sure, why not? And then share. And then I think it's supposed to pop up. Yeah, so we don't need anything under idea, really. We don't need anything under Gradle. And then everything else I think should be okay. Great. Here we go. Here you go. So now I have, I have the standard in Kotlin. You know, I will update this, you know, link a little bit. You can see all the little details about, you know, Kotlin has an extension, which is KT, KT, standard Kotlin. And uh, yeah, that's that's all that it is. Uh, I hope you found this just a, a, a tiny bit interesting as I am learning and exploring about these different languages and how they work and, you know, all the little details about these languages. We're learning things along the way. Even if you're if you decide to stick to a particular language or a particular framework or a particular ecosystem, just look a little bit outside of the box. See what's out there. See what other programming languages are doing. See what what they're really, you know, up to, you know, because you'll find a little bit of genius everywhere. You know, there's genius in every single detail around you. And if you can learn from all of that and then bring it back, you you know to your ecosystem and your development system it can truly evolutionize you know the way you you develop systems and the beauty of the work that you're doing and the kind of devotion and dedication that you put in the work that you're doing uh, i hope you found this useful as usual if you have any questions comments concerns uh please feel free to drop comments in the comment section uh thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in another video don't forget to like and subscribe take care